Scott Schaefer. I'm with the Center for Interfaith University. Now, Scott did his undergraduate at Southern Illinois State University. Um, and then he went up to uh, UC Santa Cruz and did his focus master's and his uh, PhD at the Sloan School. After that, Scott um, went down to San Bernardino yeah, for Saint Professor San Bernardino on some type of teaching. Uh, no, that was a, that was a, just like an adjunct position. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then after that, he landed at um, uh, in Los Angeles at Santa Clara University. Um, and Scott has been there now for about a year and a half. He's been there for about two years. It's quite a long time. Yeah. Um, and so, um, having said all that, I'm going to ask Scott uh, to just say a few words about his experience. Thank you, Matt. And thank you for the. Uh, Thank you for the invitation to come down to Moss Landing and uh, talk a little bit about the research that I've been doing um, at San Jose State as well as um, before when I was a graduate student and postdoc. Um, the goal, or not the goal, but the, the motivation for this talk is really just to give you a different spin on what you might traditionally think of as biotechnology. Um, and so I come at it and several of my colleagues, including Gita, come at it from a different viewpoint of using different types of sensors and novel technology to answer questions about what animals we're doing when we can't actually uh, observe them. So um, that sort of is the direct relation to the title, looking at the secret lives of marine animals. And I'm just going to go through um, some basic background about how technology has really changed um, our ability to um, sense what animals are doing in the environment. And then I'm going to go into a series of examples of different types of technology that I've used in my um, either as a graduate student or as a postdoc or um, now as faculty at San Jose State. Um, and I'll talk about, first of all, logging heart rate in um, free-ranging albatrosses. And then I'll talk a little bit about some of the migration work that I um, did um, up to the shearwaters, which if you've been here for a while, you may have heard before in a seminar that I did uh, several years ago, uh, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, and then I'll talk about how we can apply some of this technology to look at um, conservation questions. And then I'm going to end by talking about something I won't say totally new. It was totally new the last time you gave this talk, but it's new and stuff you, you probably haven't seen. And it's uh, kind of breaking some new ground, I think. OK, so our traditional view of biotechnology is generally focused on the marriage between the biological sciences and the field of technology. And in fact, because Wikipedia says so, it's got to be true, right? Uh, Basically, they define biotechnology as uh, looking at the use of living systems uh, to, and or organization, organisms, I should say, to look at development of new products that can enhance uh, our human lives, basically. And I think most people would traditionally view biotechnology as a marriage more between molecular um, aspects and uh, technology uh, in and of itself. Uh, and this is kind of, if you, if you did a, a search online, uh, you would pull up a figure that looks like this. In fact, I got it online, and I feel terrible. I didn't cite my source. But uh, this is what people view biotechnology. And you don't, if you look at this bubble diagram, you don't see ecology in there. You don't see conservation in there. You don't see uh, behavior in there. Okay, and so generally, most people view it as something that is more associated with um, molecular and nanotechnology and so forth. But uh, I would argue that you could also call uh, biotechnology in uh, the field of ecology and behavior and uh, physiology, but what you're doing instead is using different types of sensors uh, and trying to capture the responses that animals are eliciting uh, as they move about their daily lives. So in this case, it's, it's um, uh, a more or less a non-traditional view, if you will, of biotechnology. But 
just as applicable. In fact, most people view this as biologging science. Um, I still think it's biotechnology because it's not all about logging. Sometimes it's about transmitting something, etc. cetera. Um, and of course, the technology has really progressed. Um, this was actually, this is not a Photoshop. This is a real cover of National Geographic in 1971. And it shows a Gen 2 penguin carrying a backpack and uh, probably a VHF radio transmitter here. And it's probably got some other types of gadgets to look at what that animal is doing uh, in its environment. Okay, fortunately, uh, the technology has improved to the point where it's things have gotten much smaller and much better. And I'll show you his, an example. So here is a fur seal with a uh, photomechanical dive recorder, time depth recorder. And these original time depth recorders were basically a mechanical device that scribed uh, information on a, a film strip, basically. And in fact, if you listen to Jerry Coyman, uh, who Gita worked with, and I know very well, he actually made this out of parts, uh, basically like a kitchen timer. Uh, it's a very, it was a very large instrument, and it had to be attached with a, um, a harness. And then uh, when I was a graduate student, um, these kinds of tags, um, this is a, a fur seal as well, and it's got, you can see there's a, um, a tag there and a TDR there. And those are based on microprocessors. So right away you can see that, uh, and this was probably mid-90s, and you can see that there's already a change in A, how the tag is attached to the animal, and the, the size and shapes of these devices. And if you combine that with the fact that these things recorded a lot more data um, because of the memory, you get a lot more information about what that animal is doing. And of course, this was work by uh, Mike Weiss, who was a, a former graduate student here and in graduate school with Gita and myself and Mike, or uh, yeah. And so he basically deployed these um, CTD tags on these California sea lions. And these tags basically would not only tell you the location of the animal because it had a um, satellite uh, component to it, but it also measured the animal's diving depth and time and swim speed. And in addition to that, it was a, a functioning, a fully functioning CTD. So in essence, this animal was an oceanographer. Uh, and again, this, this, all this change in technology really uh, occurred over uh, probably about 20 years. Uh, this, to so sort of show it graphically, this figure just illustrates the change in the numbers of studies uh, going back to, well, going back to the 1960s um, with some of the original TDR studies. But you can see for many years, it was just a few studies each year. But of course, what changed all this was the capacity for people to um, use and access PC computers because that's about 19, the mid-1980s or early 1980s was when PC computers first really started to become accessible to uh, the mainstream public. And that changed not only the ability to analyze data, but it also drove the technology to improve and become smaller and smaller. And you can see this only goes up to 2000, but if I were to continue that out, it would probably continue to to increase at an exponential rate. And this change in technology really allowed us to refine the kinds of questions that we ask. Um, so for example, initially when this uh, technology first became available, uh, more, there were more studies just looking at basic natural history of the animals and where they're going. Now, there is a greater emphasis on asking hypothesis-driven questions, and um, the, the questions are becoming more and more sophisticated. And of course, not only does that uh, the technology change the questions we can ask, 
but it also has drastically changed the types of analyses that you have to perform to uh, do this kind of analysis. When I was a graduate student, I felt really pretty good about my background in statistics. Uh, I wasn't an expert in statistics like someone like Matt, but I felt reasonably comfortable uh, with the kinds of analyses that I used. However, because of the, the volumes of data and the, the kinds of questions that are being asked, uh, you had to, um, and of course the incorporation of modeling, it really changed the stats. Um, they kind of went hand in hand, and of course you couldn't do anything now on a conventional, using a, a conventional spreadsheet. You have to go to a more sophisticated programming environment. Uh, you know, when I first started as a graduate student, I didn't think much about learning MATLAB. But of course, I use MATLAB more than I spend uh, time in the field. Um, and it's a valuable skill, and I can only do it because, uh, I can only do the kinds of analyses I do because of having learned an, uh, a platform like that. Uh, and of course, like I mentioned before, the volumes, the sheer volumes of data that you can collect is, has changed how we uh, analyze um, our patterns in our data and of course what we can ask. And there's also been an incorporation of using uh, satellite remote sensing data as well. The other thing that technology has done for us has, uh, because of the shrinking size of the tags that we use, um, it has allowed us to uh, increase our understanding of species that 20 years ago, nobody would have ever thought of putting a tag on because they were just too big and the species are too small. And so now, because of the technology has gotten better and smaller, it's become easier to put these tags out on uh, smaller animals. Not only that, but the, t the tags and the, the technology has gotten cheaper. So for me, I'm not as concerned now about putting a tag on, on a bird and losing that tag because I can go to Amazon.com and buy a tag that does exactly what I need, I brought one here, for 50 bucks. Before, when I first bought these tags, uh, I was spending 1500 bucks a piece. And so now I can get them for $50 and it's cheap. And uh, so I don't mind if I lose a tag here and there um, as a consequence. Uh, and of course, um, uh, the, the, the species that we've been able to study and, and, and by this change in technology has really um, uh, basically allowed us to open up answer a number of different questions about patterns of use and multi-species interactions. Um, the technology has also gotten more efficient so that, you know, another tag that I brought with me, I could put on a bird for two years and it would continue to tag or continue to log data from that bird for more than a year. And again, that's not something that was readily available uh, a long time ago. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is just talk about some of the different types of examples of technology that uh, we have at our disposal. And I'm gonna talk, focus on, on a particular species that I studied for my PhD thesis. And this is uh, wandering albatrosses. These are the largest uh, flying seabirds. Um, they weigh about 10 kilograms and they have this incredibly long wingspan. That wingspan is um, over three meters in length. So 12 feet. So talk about a turkey-sized bird with these long wings flying over uh, thousands of kilometers of ocean. And these birds were really ideal uh, subjects because they are so large and because the technology at the time uh, wasn't that small, we could put a lot of uh, devices on a bird like this and it's not gonna really affect its flight capability. So uh, these birds have really long wings. As I mentioned, uh, you know, three meters in length. They stand about a meter high. And here I'm just measuring uh, the wing traces. Now one of the things about these birds is that uh, they have a very low cost of flight as they fly around the ocean because 
they can basically parasitize the wind. The energy that's uh, pushing them along in the wind, they can use and exploit and travel thousands of kilometers at a very low cost. And what we wanted to do was to look at uh, whether we could quantify the effort of the birds as they foraged and sort of pinpoint it to specific activity or foraging behavior. And so what we did was we placed a conventional satellite tracking tag on the bird. I'll pass that one around. Um, those tags at the time weighed about 60 grams. This one actually weighed about 35 grams, so this is a newer model. Uh, the one that I'm passing around the room is about 30 grams. And these tags communicate, basically they're just a high-powered um, radio tag. And the satellites overhead can triangulate a position on the bird and then it reports back to us. So in this case, it's just a transmitter. Um, but in addition to that, we also placed these um, wet-dry activity loggers on the birds, and these weighed 35 grams. So um, what these did was at each side of the, the tag, there was a point, and when the tag was fully immersed in water, it would basically um, create a conductivity, not a short, but essentially it would tell me whether the bird was sitting on the water or whether it was in flight. And then in addition to that, we also used um, these polar uh, heart rate monitors. And these were nothing more than just the standard devices. And what we did was we just took them out of the case and we attached to each end of the electrode a gold-plated safety pin. And those safety pins were inserted underneath the skin and clipped on either side of the bird's spine. And so each bird uh, left with a satellite tracking tag, a wet dry recorder, and the heart rate monitor. Now that sounds like a lot, but you have a lot of real estate to work with in the back of the bird. And all told, each bird only had about 110 grams of mass. And for a 10 kilogram bird, that's less than, or right around 1% of its total body mass. Uh, which most people deem acceptable for not changing the animal's behavior. And so what we can do with this information is ask some more sophisticated questions. So with the tags that we used, we were able to look at the distance traveled. And this is uh, just the, some tracks of some of those birds. This is, uh, to orient you, this is um, the Crozet Archipelago. This is South Africa. And the Antarctic is down here. And so you can see already these birds are traveling pretty uh, far distances. Uh, we could look at the behavioral state of the bird by um, whether it was in the air, whether it was uh, sitting on the sea surface, or whether it was uh, running. And then, of course, we also um, can measure its heart rate instantaneously. And so we could link these changes in uh, effort measured by our heart rate loggers and look to see whether there was an effect of distance or the, the speed of the travel or the time in flight or the number of landings, which gives us an indication of the activity of the bird. And so what we wanted to do was find out which of these behaviors actually uh, affected foraging effort. This is, uh, unfortunately, I got cut off here at the bottom. This was a paper that uh, my PhD advisor, one of my PhD advisors, uh, Ulrich Weimerskirch, published. Uh, and I was a co-author on this paper, but myself and his technician did the, the work in the field. And what this shows is an example of a single bird with the heart rate. So here's time uh, across the x-axis, and this is heart rate in BPMs. And when the bird's sitting on its nest, you can see that the heart rates are about 60 beats per minute. But you see that it changes considerably when the bird's just walking in the colony and then ultimately taking off in flight landing on the water, taking off in flight. And what you see is a distinct pattern where when the bird's in these periods of long sustained flight, its heart rate is just a little bit over resting heart rate, what it's, it's at when it's sitting on its nest. And you can actually correlate the changes in heart rate to what's happening when the bird's uh, flying either with the wind or against the wind. So what this shows on the, the right side is whether the bird was flying in a headwind or a tailwind, this is the heart rate 
and um, the speed and um, the, the angle uh, at which the wind is, is in relation to the bird's uh, body or its uh, trajectory. And what you find is that as the bird is flying more into headwinds, the average heart rates are actually higher uh, compared to when um, the bird is flying more with a tailwind. These birds don't fly with a tailwind most of the time. Usually it's to the side. But um, what we think is probably happening is that is the animal is making you know, small changes in its uh, uh, orientation, and that is enough to cause a change in the heart rate. But if we look at an average, an overall average for all the birds that we um, uh, tagged with these devices, um, this was, I think, 10 birds, the data from 10 birds. This dashed line represents the overall average uh, during the time at sea. This is what happens when the bird's sitting on its nest, so it's very close to our resting heart rate. And um, this is what's happening when the bird's sitting on the water, when it's taking off from the water, and when it goes into sustained flight. The main point to get from this is that the heart rates are highest for this bird when it's taking off and landing. And we wouldn't, we wouldn't get at this information if we didn't have this technology. Um, now, why does this actually occur? Well, because these wings aren't very good for flapping flight. They're superb for um, soaring. But the trade-off is that if they have a long, narrow wing, that's great for soaring, it's not very good for flapping flight. And so it's actually hard for them to get up off the water or get off the land, uh, and they have to expend a lot of energy. But in flight, it's very, very cheap. And it's that supported by the heart rates. And then for my actual PhD work, I measured the field metabolic rates of the bird using betelly ladies water on a different set of birds and showed that the cost of flight was only about two times BMI. So it's very cheap. So that's one example of the use of, of um, this type of technology. And I should mention that out of all the birds that we put these tags on, I think one of them came back with a slight abscess from where the electrode went in. The rest of them all came back looking really, really good. None of the tags got pulled out. And nobody abandoned their nest. And there was actually a study that was just published in Science uh, just a few months ago that did very used very similar technology to look at bar-headed geese flying over the Himalayan mountains. Really cool technology. You couldn't do that 50, 30, 40 years ago. OK, so what I'm going to focus on now is a slightly different story. And you guys should probably be familiar with these birds um, because they'll start showing up here in a few weeks. And they'll continue to be here throughout uh, uh, most of the, the summer and then into autumn. And you've probably heard several talks from Melinda's work as well as Josh Adams. And, and I even gave a seminar here several years ago and featured some of this. But these birds are about the size of a loaf of bread. Uh, but they undergo this extraordinary migration. And so um, this is what I'm going to focus on for this part of the talk. Um, now, this is a typical scene that you might see here in uh, right off of Monterey. In fact, this was here somewhere off central California, and I'm judging by the trees that maybe it was uh, Pacific Grove. But this is an incredibly dense flock of sooty shearwater. And yet, we didn't know, we knew they showed up here, and we knew they bred predominantly in New Zealand. Uh, but they also breed at some colonies in South America, the Falkland Islands. Australia. This was the, um, the, the thought as far as their migration patterns. Because we knew that they bred here and they showed up here, but nobody really knew which way they were going. But everybody believes that they did this pan-Pacific sweep. Sorry for the misspelling there. Um, and that they would just continue the sweep and come back here uh, to breed the following year. So what we did was using uh, technology that, uh, again, was made small enough. And this is another tag that I'm just going to pass around. 
Um, these are geolocation tags. <coughs> these devices actually measured um, uh, one location per day based on the changes in day length. So they measure every 60 seconds, they measure what the intensity of the sun was doing. And if you can capture the time of sunrise and sunset, you can calculate midday. And if you know your midday uh, and the relationship to um, Greenwich Mean, you can calculate your longitude. And if you know your longitude and you know the length of the day, then you can estimate your latitude. And so that's the basis of how these tags work. These tags also uh, recorded the diving information, for instance, and I'll show you a little bit of that information as well. Now, this work was all done at night, and these are the burrows. Uh, so this was the real high-tech part of this whole work. Um, these expensive trap doors that cost all of about $4 to make. Um, and I had to make several trips down to New Zealand to deploy these tags and then recover them. And so the work was all done at night because that's the only time these birds come back to their burrows. And so here I'm just attaching the tag uh, to the plastic Darvik band, which goes around uh, the bird site. Uh, so this is actually one of the birds that came back after a year. Uh, and you can see the tag right there on the bird itself. And you can get an idea of how big these tags are. Uh, overall, we put out um, a total of 33. Uh, and some of those were recovered when the birds were breeding, and the rest of them went out on migration. And we recaptured uh, about 65% of the birds that came back. The birds that did not come back, we don't know the exact fate of them. They could have gone to a different burrow, a uh, different island. Um, they could have also perished at sea as well, because we know there is a mortality rate associated with this migration. But you can see that that most of the birds looked like this in terms of what the leg looked like after removing that tag after a year. It had a little bit of callousing, but by and large, that was all that we saw. This is the, the actual data of the migration patterns. So the light blue is uh, what the birds were doing when they were breeding. So they were breeding here, and then also another island in between the main uh, north and south island of New Zealand. And during breeding, they're making these regular trips down to Antarctic waters. Uh, and then in uh, roughly March, late March, they start heading uh, east, traveling on the westerly winds that push them eastwards. And then um, basically what I did is I just split this between 30 uh, north and 30 south. But what you can see is this. Um, passageway over equatorial waters, and this is the fa fastest part of their journey. Uh, they basically looked as though they tried to just get to the other side. And once they were there, they spent, um, they went to one of three areas, and they did not do this Pan-Pacific sweep. So most of the birds went here to the Western Pacific. Uh, a few birds went to Alaska, and then a number of birds went to coast of California. And then uh, about the end of September, early October, they all headed home. And all these birds, regardless of whether they were in California, Alaska, or the Western Pacific, all crossed the equator within 10 days of each other. Uh, and they all funneled through a pretty narrow corridor back to New Zealand. And again, they made a fairly quick uh, trek to get there. So we can right away throw out this hypothesis. Uh, and I should also mention that we did this two seasons. We only published uh, one season's worth. Um, but I'll show you a track in a moment that actually shows two complete migrations. Um, so we haven't seen this, and we haven't seen this in any of the other species that have been studied since then. Uh, this is some of the diving information that this, just an example of one bird, uh, recorded. And these tags record the diving depths as well as the temperature of the data, or the temperature of the tag or the environment. And so the, the blue traces show the diving depth, and that's what's here on the, the left side of this axis. Uh, the red shows 
the temperature, and the black shows the time when the bird's at its nest or during its breeding period, and the green is all migration. And so a couple things stand out. One, you can see that birds are, you know, these, these shearwaters are diving to, um, you know, 30 meters is pretty common, but in some cases down to 70 meters. Um, the other cool thing is you can see when the bird's coming back to its nest, because that's these high points, it's either at its nest or it's at waters close to its nest. And clearly when it's down here, it's in Antarctic waters. Because if you look at the scale on this side, you see that it's you know, somewhere around four to five degrees. Uh, and, but the other cool thing is you can tell when the bird's crossing the equator. Because now you can see the rise in um, temperature on its way down and also on its way back. And if you look at what the diving, they're doing hardly any diving. And this, I should say, this pattern was the same for all the birds that we tracked. Very little diving when they're crossing equatorial waters. Now, why might that be the case? Well, we know that with exception of the equatorial uh, current that is running uh, across, there's very little productivity. And so you can actually um, look at this in sort of a um, two dimensions. So here I have time of year on the x-axis, and this is the same for all three of these panels. This is diving depth, SST, or sea surface temperature, and primary productivity. And the primary productivity data was satellite remote sense data. And you can see that when the birds are in the southern hemisphere, it's high productivity. The water's cooler, but it's trending warmer as they get closer to the equator. And of course, this is what they're doing, uh, all this diving depths. But again, when you look at what they're doing when they're crossing the equator, very little diving because there's probably very little productivity and the water's just warm. And of course, they have the best sensor. They have their feet. And their feet, when they touch down the water, they can tell whether, I'm sure it's maybe not 30 degrees, but they can certainly tell when it's warm or cold. And so that would probably, that in addition to their navigational abilities, would um, tell us a little bit about their behavior and what they're sensing. So I'm just pointing out this one particular bird because this illustrates the repeatability of its migration paths. Um, this is a bird that we actually missed the first time. So I put the tag out um, in uh, January, or yeah, it was, no, it was March here. And the bird continued to breed and it was doing these regular trips like everybody else. And then it departed on its way but, uh, and it went on its migration, but it left this spot later than everybody else. In fact, almost two months later. And so by the time it actually got back to New Zealand, um, I was at the field site in uh, late November and early December and had left, I think, on the 18th of December. And so I missed catching this bird by about seven days. But that's okay because it went on another migration. But because it arrived late back at the colony, it did not breed. But it hung out until about mid-February, and then it went on its way and arrived up here earlier than everybody else, and uh, got here up in, in March. And then it came back, and we captured it the second season. So all told, this bird uh, did over 100,000 kilometers in two consecutive migrations that were almost, I won't say identical, but they were pretty close. So this combined with other birds that we tracked over consecutive seasons shows that they're not doing this pan Pacific sweep. It's more of this figure eight pattern. And that technology has really helped us uh, learn something about that. Now how can we apply this information to help conserve and better manage the species and the resources that are there. Well, probably the biggest problem that these kinds of animals face is their uh, susceptibility to being uh, killed uh, from bycatch or as bycatch. Uh, and in fact, uh, many species, um, hundreds of thousands, uh, are killed each year. And so, 
one of the things that we did was deploy these, again, the same type of technology on these Lays and Albatrosses in Hawaii. And in fact, this shows uh, data for black footed albatrosses, but we deploy tags on both black footed and Lays and albatrosses because they breed at the same location. And what this shows, working with folks at BirdLife International, is they were able to um, overlay the distribution of the birds with fishing effort. So here are um, the kernel densities of the distributions of black footed albatrosses during um, both breeding and non breeding. And the circles represent fishing effort of uh, predominantly the Hawaii longline fleet and some of the other um, longline fleets in the Western Pacific. And it's clear that these birds are overlapping in their distribution with the fishing effort. And the fishermen, you know, you could talk to them and, and say, well, you know, they, they, they might say, well, I only kill one bird a year. What's the big deal? And, you know, how do I know that they're only, you know, the one bird that I caught was maybe anomalous? Well, in fact, clearly these data show that they're not, that's not an anomalous pattern. And when you multiply all those ships that are all each catching one bird, it starts to add up. And it takes a toll. So this is one use of, the, of that kind of data. And one of my shearwaters actually, unfortunately, met its demise uh, here off of uh, Argentina. This bird was breeding in New Zealand. And it was doing its uh, regular trips to the Antarctic. And then it left. And unfortunately, this is the only one of the my study subjects that went around the Cape and up the eastern side of South America. All the rest of my birds stayed in the Pacific. This is the only one that went in, into the Atlantic. And unfortunately, it was caught in a fisherman's net. And that fisherman contacted me and said, hey, I have your tag. Uh, I'd love to send it back to you. And so that was how I got these data. Now, these shearwater species in the Pacific, it's believed that somewhere between 1 and 12 million of them were taken in, as bycatch uh, in predominantly the, the gill fishing or gill net fishing uh, fleet. And fortunately, they've they've banned most of that. But uh, those birds um, were taken quite a lot. And this is just direct evidence to show that. So uh, another application for conservation that I'll just talk a little bit about. Um, going back to the heart rate stuff that I did. Um, so one of the things that we wanted to investigate, when, since the birds had the heart rate monitors on them before they went to sea, we wanted to look to see whether it was, if there was any influence on heart rate associated with um, when the bird would actually see us approaching it on its nest. And you can imagine this has implications for ecotourism. You know, um, lots of ships go down to the Antarctic and some of these uh, sub-Antarctic places so that the tourists can see these birds. And the birds aren't eliciting, I mean, they're not, generally they're not going to be shaking. And so if they're sitting on their nest, they may not, you may not be able to see a visible response. But clearly, what our study shows is that they are eliciting a physiological response at a minimum. So what we did is, we marked off from a particular nest different distances. And then what we did is we had somebody hiding in a bush uh, and, or over a knoll and watching the bird's response to the person that was going to walk up to the nest. And so here you see the heart rate of the bird uh, before detection. And um, this is percent of basal heart rate. So this is an easy way to just say, OK, it's all relative. So 100% would be 60 beats per minute. And what, you, and, and what I've got shown here are da data for males and females. And so before the, the bird is detecting anybody, its heart rate is essentially at rest. But then shortly after uh, it detects somebody close by, its heart rate almost doubles. And then as you move closer and closer to the bird, its heart rate uh, almost 
quadruples. And yet, you don't see the bird doing anything else except sitting on its nest. These data clearly show that, that heart rates, the bird is eliciting some physiological response as a function of what it's uh, you know, being approached by. And um, so, and in, in fact, what you also see is that it takes a while for that heart rate to drop back down to basal levels. So although that cost may not be very high, it over, you know, you can imagine that over time with all these people visiting places, and of course we want them to visit because that's the only way they're gonna care about seeing these kinds of animals, we just have to be mindful of the fact that, that these kinds of physiological changes can occur even though a visible change on the surface isn't always apparent. Okay, so the last part of my talk is just gonna focus on something new. So um, years ago, I was at a meeting and, um, well, it actually had started from a paper that I reviewed. And it was a paper that looked at heart rates and, of these birds. And, and it was very similar to what I just showed you with the wandering albatrosses. They were looking at ecotourism. And what they did was they used these um, egg loggers that measured heart rates. And they placed it under giant petrels. And then they looked at the heart rates and looked to see um, uh, what people, <coughs> what the birds, how the birds would, re would respond to people walking up to them and just measuring the heart rates. Very similar to what I just showed you. <coughs> but I had this other idea of if the eggs could tell us something about what they're doing uh, when they're sitting on these eggs. And you know, all of us, probably everybody in the room has a smartphone, maybe not everybody, but most of us have a smartphone. And what's the one thing that the smartphone or tablet does if you change its orientation? It corrects itself, right? It'll change its orientation if you flip it on its side or flip it whatever. How does it do that? Well, it does that because the device has a 3D accelerometer and or a, a magnetometer in it. And so it can correct its orientation according to how you hold it. I'm even wearing a Fitbit watch. Okay, this Fitbit watch tracks my movements, it tracks my steps, okay? And so this type of technology is becoming more readily available. And I had the good fortune to uh, meet some PhD students at Stanford. They happen to be aeronautics and aviation students. And they were interested in looking at flight uh, performance in the albatrosses. And so they wanted to build these data loggers that would capture their soaring patterns. I said, yeah, that sounds great. I'm happy to deploy them for you. But I have another project I'd like you to work on. And they were all too happy. And these guys were, you know, in addition to being, um, you know, aviation guys, they were kind of electronics geeks. And so what I had proposed was for them to build some egg loggers for me. Now, just to give you a bit of background, um, this is what an, uh, a chick looks like, as, and this is a chicken, uh, as developing inside the egg. Uh, and it's basically the, the embryo or amnion is here, and it's got a large yolk sac, and then it's surrounded by um, albumin and water. And you can see that as the chick develops over time, that it consumes that albumin and water and makes more chick. Now the poultry industry has had a big uh, interest in this because of course they want to know how they can enhance their hatchability for making more chicks and more eggs. Okay, and so what they've done is they've gone back and they've done manipulative studies where they don't turn the eggs or they delay turning them or turn them too much or whatever. And what they find is that if the eggs are not turned properly, that they get malformed chicks. And so, and, th and then there's been some other studies looking at marked eggs in the wild and trying to sort of capture turning rates of wild birds. But there hasn't really been that much um, looked at. There has been a few egg loggers, 
but they weren't super sophisticated and they were somewhat limited. And so I wanted to know um, some basic biology about what birds are doing when they're sitting on their egg. Now it's clear not all birds turn their eggs. Megapodes like um, ostriches and, and um, um, kiwis, they don't turn their eggs. In fact, ostriches bury their eggs. So it's not essential for all species, but for the majority of the species that we know of, they have to turn their eggs. And so what I was interested in initially was, does egg turning, uh, or is egg turning affected by the age of the parents? Because you can imagine that young parents or first time parents may not know how to turn their eggs or how frequently to turn them. And so that might, lead to higher breeding failure in first-time parents. And I was thinking at this from albatrosses, because we do a lot of work on albatrosses out on the Hawaiian Islands. And you can go out in the colony, and you can see these birds standing off the egg because they get it gets warm there. And so the, the, the parent thinks it's shading the egg, but of course the, the sun is coming at it from behind, and it's beating down on the egg, and the parent's just sitting there you know, la di di da and thinking it's shading it, and it's not. And so is that because the bird just doesn't understand, or, or what? We don't know. Uh, something else is, is, you know, how is the development influenced, um, and how, is, how does the, this egg turning affect uh, hatching success? Again, you know, these are questions that have been looked at very closely in the poultry industry, but very little in uh, wild birds. And how does uh, you know egg turning uh, influence uh, by age and experience of the parents? So um, what I came up with was uh, these egg data loggers, uh, and these egg loggers would tell me the orientation changes in the eggs. So I brought some of this stuff with me just to show you. So essentially three different positions of the egg. You have um, pitching, where it's up and down like this. You have rolling, where it rolls this direction. And then yaw, which is this direction. Okay, so you have roll, pitch, and yaw. And I'll, I'll pass this egg around. This is actually a, a, a logger for a, or a, an egg for a Lazen albatross. And you can open it up. That egg was actually made on a 3D printer. Uh, so these egg loggers basically took the technology that's in your phone or your Fitbit, that is, it, it has a 3D accelerometer that can measure the roll, pitch, and yaw, and it tells me the temperature, because I have a, a temperature thermistor on. And what we wanted to do was capture these changes in egg orientation over time with different bird species and uh, ideally uh, birds of different ages. Um, I should point out that this work was funded by CSUPERB, which is a CSU initiative that funds biotechnology. And they even say on their website, we interpret biotechnology loosely. So I said, okay, here you go. They funded it to the max. And I was able to uh, get a bunch of egg loggers developed for this project. So this is, the, uh, this is one of the egg loggers, and I'll pass this other egg around this is a, a small egg, and if you open it up, you can see the egg logger inside. Um, but this is the logger itself. Um, this is actually, I say 2.0 because this was actually the second generation. Um, again, the guys at Stanford worked with me. They built one prototype. We had some problems with it. They refined it considerably, and they built the, this current version, which is what I'm using now. This, to give you an idea of size, this is a snow petrel egg. And um, this is a micro SD card. And all told, the, the logger itself only weighs about 10 grams. Um, you can see if you look at this egg that it has this plastic stuff there, and that's to fill the egg so that the egg has mass. Because we want the mass of the egg to replicate what we find in the wild. And also, we don't want the egg to be hollow because if it's hollow, the bird's gonna probably realize that and abandon it. And so, uh, <clears throat> I've now got these loggers outsourced to a company in Denver that makes them for me. 
um, for about $150 a pop. Um, these things have multiple sensors in them. They have a 3D accelerometer, so they measure all the changes associated with gravity. Uh, and then there's a 3D magnetometer in them. And the 3D magnetometer allows me to correct for exact orientation. And as you'll see in a moment, that's a really key feature. Uh, and then, of course, there's a single thermistor on this board as well, so it tells me the temperature at the core of the egg. Um, previous studies show that there is a temperature gradient across the egg, and one of the things I'd like to do in the future is, is have thermistors at the extremities. Um, these things also have a two gigabyte uh, micro SD card, and that card is removable, so I just pop it into my computer and download the data, and it's easy peasy. Um, each of the sensors record every second. So every second I get a change in each sensor as well as temperature. And uh, the eggs themselves, I've now got a source that can print them with a 3D printer. So I don't know how much more biotechnology you could get than that. But um, this was an initial study that we published last year and it was part of the thesis work of Emma Kelsey, who took classes here, so you might know her. Um, this was the cast and Zocklet, which she studied. Um, we also, I also had another graduate student who was putting them out under Western Gulls, and then we deployed them under uh, Laser and Albatrosses. Since then, we've also deployed them under um, other species. In fact, this is one of my videos. So this is me, I was down in the Antarctic last year, and I'm going to put this egg logger underneath this bird here, which is a Cape petrel. Um, I was down at the French research station uh, called Dumont de Ville, which is uh, basically south of Australia on the Antarctic continent. So you can see I had logger number 30. And this is not a great video because I'm doing this. I had my, my flip video camera and I'm doing the egg logger stuff myself. But you can see that. The bird's pretty docile. I have to say they're not all like this. This particular species was really exceptional. It was, I could do this without any problems. The snow petrels, uh, they would spit uh, oil at me. But these guys were really, um, I only had one bird spit oil of this species. The rest of them uh, were all really good. So I'm basically putting my egg logger under it, and I'm going to swap it for its real egg. And it's sitting there the whole time. And these birds, again, they thought nothing of it. I had no abandonments, uh, very easy, and they sat on the eggs for four days. And I, they would have sat on longer, but I, I just I was only doing it every three to four days because I wanted to rotate them under other birds. So um, that was a video that just shows that how, at least in this case, it was fairly easy to deploy them. Now this is what the, the kind of data that you get. So at the top uh, actually shows the changes in temperature of the egg. And the red, yellow, and black lines represent the roll, pitch, and yaw of the egg. And this is uh, data for um, a Lazan albatross just over two days. Uh, most of our deployments for a w were for a week. Um, for the gulls, it was about a week. For the cats and zocklets, it was more like three to four days. Um, we've now got data on five species. I have a collaborator in Spain who's putting them under um, parrots, captive parrots. And I have a graduate student who's using them now to look at uh, the egg turning behavior in relation to um, contaminant levels and turns. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. What this shows is the number of total turns per day. So these are averages for um, auklets, gulls, and albatrosses. And what I show is um, one of the reviewers of this paper said, well, OK, these look great. but..." But why is the magnetometer such a big deal? Well, it's a big deal because if you compare the turning rates with and without the magnetometer, you can see there's a pretty sizable difference in terms of the total number of turns 
that we can capture with these egg loggers. And this is the average turns per hour. And so um, the only one that was uh, different were cats and droplets. The gulls and the albatrosses were more similar. In fact, the data that I have on the two petrel species uh, are slightly lower than the albatross and the gull. Um, this, this figure just shows the total turns or the, the average turn angle uh, over how many times the egg was turned over a given hour. And the main thing to get from this is that they do a lot of small changes, but the majority of the bigger changes don't happen that frequently. Okay, so they're doing a lot of smaller uh, angle changes of the egg. And I should say, when I'm talking about an angle change, the, um, the guys at Stanford talked to me about what are called Euler angles. And Euler angles basically calculate the orientation change in the roll, pitch, and yaw combined from one instance to the next. So it's a way of combining all three angle changes to get a total egg change. So you might actually see a big change in yaw, a little change in roll, and a big change in pitch. And it's combined when you look at the Euler angle changes. <clears throat> okay, so the other thing that these loggers told us was that there were substantial differences between day versus night in terms of the magnitude of temperature. So the cast and zocklets, uh, during the daytime, they had a, a, the biggest change in temperature between almost two and a half degrees um, compared to um, the albatrosses, uh, a much lower uh, change in, t in total temperature between day versus night. And these are just examples of three different s individuals of each species. So, um, and this is representing the, the time on the x-axis and egg temperature. And these are auklets, so this is um, auklet 29 or whatever it is there. One, two, and three. So these are three different birds. And the blue represents daytime, the black represents night. And these are all western gulls, so there's three of them there. And then these are all albatrosses. And the thing that to get from this is that you can see a very distinct day-night pattern or cyclicity in the albatross eggs. But as you move to the smaller species, their egg temperature changes seem to be a lot more variable. And they don't seem to be quite as entrained to the day-night differences. Now, I should back up and say that these species are breeding inside a burrow. So maybe the day-night pattern isn't as driven by day-night differences as we see in the albatross and the gull, which are nesting out in the open. Um, I did bring a gull egg. This is one of our gull eggs here. Um, so this is an animation that just shows the, the egg patterns, the egg turning behavior. And this is of a western gull. And so this is over two days. So you'll see that the background gets lighter, and that's just because it's, it's going into daytime versus nighttime when it's darker. And you see there's a lot of small movements. Those may or may not be real movements. It could just be the noise in the sensor. But clearly, there are large changes in how that egg moves um, that we can now see with these egg loggers. And that goes on for a little bit, so I'll just continue on. So where are we going with this now? Well, one of the things that uh, what I'd like to do is look at the differences in egg turning behaviors between species. Because one of the things we know is that some of the seabirds lay one egg, like uh, the albatrosses and petrels, but many of them lay multiple egg nests, like the gulls. And so do they turn the eggs the same rate if they have multiple eggs? Or is it different if they have a single egg? Um, so one of the things I want to look at is, is the changes in egg turning behavior associated with habitat type, for example, polar versus temperate versus tropical, uh, clutch size, one egg versus multiple eggs, or nest type. Gulls lay a, a, a they have eggs that uh, they lay in a nest that's surrounded by twigs. Um, albatrosses, it's often just a scrape. 
if it's depending on the species. Some of them build big pedestal nests. Boobies lay eggs in a crappy stick nest. And so there could be differences in terms of how they change the egg or turn the egg associated with nest height. Um, I also want to focus more on the question, getting back to my original thought, between age and breeding experience. And then, of course, now one of the things that we're doing is looking at the effects of contaminants on the adults. Because we know that a lot of the contaminants that they um, obtain from their food can be endocrine disruptors. And that might affect certain hormone levels that affect their egg turning behavior. And so we're looking at that with, with these terns. I did some of that work with the snow petrels last year. But I think one of the other things that's of value is to look at the effects of disturbance because we know that many species that are sensitive to disturbance nest in these colonies that often are surrounded by a fence. But of course, people let their dogs through or you could have a plane fly over. And one of the things that happens when these birds uh, get disturbed, they kick the egg as they flush off the nest. And we can capture that with these egg loggers. And so I think the really the value of these things will be in the applied studies that we can go from here on out. Okay, so just to, to end, um, it's clear that, that biotechnology uh, has many applications for ecological uh, and behavioral studies. And I think um, part of this is, is going to change even more as the pace of technology continues to change uh, and increase. And I think it's really um, enhanced our understanding of what wild animals do. Uh, and I'm excited for what's possible in the future because many of these applications could be used to help um, conserve uh, many of these species and better manage uh, our resources. Um, so that, with that, I'll just acknowledge some of the funding and um, some of my graduates, former graduate students who provided some, some of the data and helped with develop the egg logger stuff. And I'm happy to take any questions if you have them. Thank you. develop a model that would describe their navigational abilities. And uh, we submitted to Nature, it was reviewed twice, but they didn't, the now whole navigational science is really fraught with dogma and they didn't want to listen to it. Mm -hmm. But the idea is that if you look at, the, at where the sun is coming up, if you're going north-south, that sun is, is going to come up over here and as you head further south, it's going to come to the point where it's behind you. And if you look at the angle at which it's transiting the sky and going down, it should go like this as you're heading north-south, or you know, depending on the season. So day length and probably uh, you know where the sun azimuth is is probably a, a big cue, but you know it's it's hard to prove uh, without some manipulating studies. Any other? Yeah. Have you examined other seabirds as well, such as penguins? with the egg loggers or? Uh, I actually, when I was down in the Antarctic last year, um, I talked to my colleagues about putting them under deli penguins. Um, as it turns out, there was another group in France that was developing a similar egg logger and they published a study um, two years before mine, but um, theirs had just two axis and no magnetometer and their turning rates were really high. And I don't know if I believe them, but uh, I haven't tried penguins since, but I have a colleague who is at SeaWorld in San Diego, and um, I've been talking to them about putting them under their, some of their penguins there. Or I could just have somebody deploy them for me in the Antarctic. So, yeah, that would be.
That would be nice. Yeah. Other? Yeah. Um, if you said this, I apologize. I must have missed it. But when you're sort of swapping out the eggs with your little egg logger thing, mm -hmm. did you then have to swap the ones that you took back yeah, out after the four day period that you had? Right. Like, what did you do? Yeah, with I completely them in the just sort of glossed over that. So, <laughs> so for the species where I took the their only egg, I put them in an incubator. And, and either the incubator turned them for us or I went and turned them by hand. Um, for the gulls, what we did is, because they're multi-egg clutches, we can just slip this one in and the egg we take out, we can just put it in the surrogate nest and then when we take this one out, we swap them back because we mark the eggs. Um, so we either put them in an incubator or we put them under a surrogate uh, parent. And so when you're turning them um, yourself, Like um, depending, depending on the species? I yeah, think. so what I would do is I would usually roll them and then spin them and sometimes flip them over. But it wasn't totally, um, uh, I probably didn't mimic exactly the way the egg loggers are turning. Because if you look at them, it's somewhat random and sporadic. Mm -hmm. um, but what I did do was look at the hatching success. Um, and the hatching success of at least the snow petrels wasn't any different than the uh, birds that were hatching eggs on their own. Um, I did have two eggs blow up in the incubator, um, but they were probably addled to begin with, which can happen for a variety of reasons, and they just got rotten and poof, blew up in the incubator. So. Yeah? I have a funding related question. You didn't put foster farms up. <laughs> I it didn't. seems like they, the chick the yeah, poultry industry was really big. Well, it's funny. There, there's a, a company online um, that's based in England that sells incubators, and I sent them my paper and I sent them the animations and said, "Hey, you know, I never heard anything back from them." So, uh, but you know, they the, the poultry industry puts a lot of money into this, and so they have a lot of controlled studies, and, and they could do all kinds of stuff that we couldn't possibly think of doing in wild birds. So. Any others? Yeah. Uh, this is a more general question, but uh, do you feel there's a big gap between uh, the biotechnology you can do in ter terrestrial realms versus what you can do in aquatic? And um, I've also heard a lot of things um, about possibly there are things you can do in the aquatic realm, but researchers just aren't doing it as much? Mm -hmm. Well, I would say that um, a lot of the tag development stuff, I think the marine folks push that further or faster than the terrestrial folks. Hmm. It, it makes sense if you think about it because, you know, when we're looking at animals like a seal, once it leaves the beach, you don't, you don't see it again until it comes back. And so having a, a mechanism that records its behavior or pings a satellite was really key. I mean, it totally changed our view of what some of these animals do. And so I think there was a drive to push that faster in the marine world just because of that lack of, of being able to see what our animals do versus in the, the terrestrial. Maybe that's my bias, but that's just the sense that I have based on the tags that I've seen developed and the examples of species they use to promote them. It seems to be mostly moving. Well, thanks, Great. Scott, for coming. Thanks.